If you would, we're going to turn to 3 John this morning. We're going to bring our sermon series to a close. 3 John, although in verse count, it's 15 verses, it's actually one of the shortest, if not the shortest, letter in the Bible. And don't let the size of this letter fool you, um, because what John has to say in it is very powerful, um, very pointed, and we're going to work through that this morning. This is a very short and personal letter from John to a man by the name of Gaius. Gaius was a friend of the Apostle John. Um, some believe he was perhaps even a convert of John's. <clears throat> he calls him, John in this letter says that it brings him joy that his children walk in the truth. So there is some belief that maybe Gaius was one of John's converts. Third John was written sometime between A.D. 90 and 95, around the same time as 1st and 2nd John were written. And what we find within this letter, John gives us a glimpse into an assembly, a church. He gives us a glimpse into its people and its problems. And when we work through this passage today, um, you'll, you'll most likely see that Times have not changed very much. Um, a lot of people say, I just wish the church would go back to how it was in the first century in the early church as if the church didn't have any issues in the first century. And we're going to see they had, they had their fair share of issues ever since the church's inception. And I wonder why that is, why the church has always faced challenges full of people. Where there are people, there are problems. Um, but also where there are problems, there are opportunities for solutions to the problems. And so we're going to see that today. The church is supposed to be a united community in Christ and for Christ. We are to be united. There's to be harmony in the church. That is God's will for believers to be like-minded, striving together for a common cause. The church is supposed to be a place where Christ is exalted. It's to be a place where the lost are evangelized. It's a, to be a place where the saints are equipped and edified for the work of the ministry. The church is to be a place where the love of Jesus is extended to this world, to, for missions and outreach. That's the purpose of the church. It should be a united community of believers, but where there are people, there are problems. Yeah. Our church, any church throughout history is not exempt from that. And we have to be reminded sometimes, yeah. and that's okay. We have to be reminded, all of us, every church, every Christian, has to be reminded of the way we're walking, how we're talking, what we're doing, how we're reaching out. Are we a united community in Christ and for Christ. And so we may have to face the question, am I a part of the problem or am I part of the answer and the solution? And so a community uh, that is united in Christ and for Christ is a church community that is grounded in truth, in love, and hospitality. And a commitment to truth and love, out of that will flow in abundance hospitality. And that is the issue that we see in 3 John. We're going to meet three men today. This passage centers around three men. It's written to Gaius. But we're going to also meet a man by the name of Diotrephes and Demetrius. And we're going to see how truth, love, and hospitality relate to them. You see, they had a community of believers, an assembly that should have been in Christ and for Christ, but actually what we find in 3 John is a community in crisis. And that is the title of our sermon today, Community in Crisis. And so what was the crisis? What was the crisis that John was writing to Gaius about? Well... John is going to reveal that to us in this letter. We're going to work our way there. He directs our attention to these three men. And so let's read just the first two verses. We're going to work our way through this passage. John opens his letter by saying this, The elder to my dear friend Gaius, whom I love 
in the truth. Dear friend, I pray that you are prospering in every way and are in good health, just as your whole life is going well, or another translation of that could mean, or as your soul prospers. Your translation may say that. And so this greeting, these first two verses, reveal something to us about John and about Gaius. It shows us that there was this personal, intimate relationship that the two of them had. They knew each other. They were friends. And again, very likely that Gaius was a convert of John's and John's ministry. And so they had a close relationship. John loved Gaius in the truth. Not merely that he truly loved him, but that he loved him as a fellow believer and as one who was a servant for the truth and for the cause of Jesus. He loved Gaius because Gaius was committed to living out the truth and the word of God in his life. And we see in just the greeting that John is praying for him. He's praying for his physical health as well as his spiritual health. Shouldn't read too much into that. Does, a lot of people may believe that, well, Gaius was maybe physically ill. Could be. But this was a standard greeting, an opening of a letter. Um, John was praying for Gaius, his physical health and his spiritual health, so that he wouldn't be restricted in the work of the ministry. So there wouldn't be any barriers in his way. The same is true in our day to day. We pray for one another. You should pray for your church leaders. We should pray for those who are doing missionary work that their work wouldn't be hindered, that they would be healthy physically and spiritually. And so we get that glimpse of that relationship right off the bat in the first two verses. Gaius, the recipient, receiving this letter from the Apostle John. And so Gaius will be the first person that we consider today, this morning, in this community in crisis. Read with me in verses 3 through 4. John goes on and says this, For I was very glad when fellow believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in truth. In verse 4, I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in truth. And so here we meet Gaius, and we're going to call him Gaius the Authentic in verses 3 through 8 that we're going to go through. John tells us right off the bat in verse 3 and 4 that he was very glad. He was very glad and he had no greater joy because of what others were telling John about Gaius. And what were they telling him? That the truth was in him. He says that believers came and testified to your fidelity to the truth, how you are walking in the truth. And so Gaius lived out what he believed in doctrine and deed. Gaius was an authentic believer and an authentic follower for Jesus and in the church. He lived it. There was no contradiction in Gaius' life between his profession and his practice. Or in other words, his walk and his talk were the same. He walked it. He not only spoke it, he didn't give lip service he actually lived the life of truth. When we read Scripture, there is no greater, no greater commendation and no higher praise that a Christian can receive than that of walking in the truth. Luke eleven twenty eight tells us that blessed, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. James 1, 22 through 24, be doers of the word and not what? Hearers only. Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. So there is a blessing of being a doer of the word. Gaius was a doer. He lived it, he believed it, and he walked it out. And the great grief in ministry is this. The greatest grief in ministry is when people are apathetic to the Word of God and they reject the Word of God and God's 
direction through his word. And you can see it. You can see it. We can give great, and anyone, any Christian, any church can give such great lip service to what they believe. But there is apathy when it comes to taking God's word and applying it to our life and living out the gospel, living out the truth. Gaius was not one of those people. Gaius was not apathetic. He lived it out. And so what else do we learn about him? We first learn here very clearly in verses 3 through 4 that Gaius walked in the truth. Secondly, what we learn about Gaius is this, and it's huge, is that he served faithfully and he loved practically. Read with me in verses 5 through 8. John goes on commending Gaius. He says, Dear friend or beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever you do for the brothers, especially when they are strangers. They have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God, since they set out for the sake of the name. I don't know about you, but the name in my Bible is capitalized. It's referring to Christ, okay? Accepting nothing from pagans. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we can be co-workers or partners with the truth. And so Gaius served faithfully. He loved practically. And very likely, the missionaries, the traveling ministers that Gaius welcomed into his home brought report back to John about his hospitality, about his truthful and faithful and loving walk in the Lord. Very likely that's what took place. And even though these traveling ministers and missionaries were strangers, Gaius still opened his home up to them. He offered them hospitality, meaning he gave them shelter. He gave them food prayer, encouragement, financial support, and the, the, the necessities needed to carry out the ministry. That's what hospitality is, and he provided it. In John's day, travelers depended on this. They depended on fellow Christians to open their homes. That was how their ministry was supported. To support a missionary and a traveling minister was to share in their ministry. It was a way to not only say, I love fellow workers for Jesus, but that I love them enough to open my home and sacrificially give of myself, my time, my resources to them so that they can take the word to the other parts of the world that, that, that I cannot reach. And they were traveling, and they depended on this. They depended on the hospitality of others. The Bible stresses the importance of hospitality. In the Old Testament, what God charged Israel with is this. He says, You shall not oppress a stranger, since you yourselves know the feelings of a stranger, for you also were strangers in the land of Egypt. In Psalm 146.9, The Lord watches over the sojourners, or the strangers, or the resident aliens. He protects them. He watches over them. When we look at providing hospitality, we go to the New Testament, Zacchaeus. He provided hospitality to Jesus, as did the Samaritan village of Sychar, Simon the Pharisee, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Simon the leper, and the two disciples on the road to Emmaus all extended hospitality to Jesus. The apostles, they enjoy the hospitality of the Jews and the Gentiles. Who did Paul lodge with? Cornelius, right? What about the, the jailer that he came into contact with? Lydia, Priscilla, Aquila. They opened their homes. The home was a central part in the life of the church in that day. It looks different in our day today because we have hotels and other places like that. But our church supports missionaries. We have some from within our own church. We have the Harringtons that are serving Costa Rica, and we support them. Reach Texas offering is coming up, um, and you may not know what that is, but we're going to have a week of prayer and an offering taken up for, the, for missions and evangelism within the state of Texas. That is a way that the church can provide support for the work of the ministry. If you go to 2 John, 
you're going to see a contrast. In 2 John, John is saying, do not open your home and provide hospitality to false teachers. Because if you do that, you're sharing in the work of their ministry, which is heresy. In 3 John, he's saying, open your home, especially for those who are teaching and preaching the truth of Jesus and the gospel. So guys, he loved faithfully, serve faithfully. Hospitality was actually a Christian duty in this time. It wasn't just an obligation for the culture. It was a duty. It was a practical expression to say, hey, I love you enough. I'm going to open my home for you. You have nowhere else to stay, and I'm going to support you because we're in this together. And so John is writing, essentially telling Gaius, keep on doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. And John provides three reasons why we should support a faithful, all faithful servants of Christ, especially missionaries. He says that right in verse 7, he says, they set out for the sake of the name, that is the cause of Jesus, share in the gospel to parts of the world that we may never be able to reach on our own, but that God calls people and sends them to other parts of the world. They are going out and you should support them because they're taking the word of Jesus. Second reason, they don't, ex they don't accept support from unbelievers or Gentiles, your translations may say. Their ministry is not funded by unbelievers. Their ministry is funded by believing Christians. And third reason why we should support all faithful servants as Gaius did is we become partners with them. I've already alluded to that. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 41, Jesus says this. He says, The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. To offer hospitality is to join in the ministry. John chapter, or Second John, he says, if anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your home and don't greet him, for the one who greets him shares in his evil works, is what John says in Second John. And so Gaius was an authentic believer through and through. And I believe that the church in our day needs more men and women like Gaius, who are faithful, who are committed, who obey God without hesitation and live for him. So we're going to move on now. We're going to consider our second individual, and this is where we're going to see the crisis that was going on. And it was by a man named Diotrephes. What a name is that? And we're going to call him Diotrephes the dictator. Let's read these verses together. We're going to meet this dictator here. In the church, by the way. A leader believed in the church. Verse 9, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have first place among them, does not receive our authority. This is why, if I come, I will remind him of the works he is doing, slandering us with malicious words. Or your translation may say that he was speaking wicked nonsense. That's seriously, ESV says that. And he is not satisfied with that. He not only refuses to welcome fellow believers, but he even stops those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Wow, he sounds like a lovely man. Dear friend, in verse 11, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good, he's telling Gaius. The man who does good is of God. The one who does evil has not seen God. So we have Diotrephes, the dictator. He was the cause of the crisis within the assembly, and it was not specific to the first century. We have a Diotrephes disease in our churches throughout our nation today that we have to be aware of. Diotrephes is not a person you want to put on a head of a committee or a team because Diotrephes is about Diotrephes. He's not the one you want on your welcoming committee. He would tell them to go out the door and expel them. And so what's interesting is this. Verse 9, John says, I wrote something to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have first place, rejects our authority. Could it be that John wrote a letter 
intended to be read for the church and Diotrephes intercepted it and destroyed it? Very likely. Very likely that Gaius may have been one of the people that was expelled from the church because he supported fellow believers. Just a suggestion. It's a possibility. Gaius may have still been in the church facing the pressure, seeing what was going on, and had no clue that a letter was ever written from John, which is why John likely sent Demetrius to, for Demetrius that we're going to read about to take Gaius the letter to be read. Because you have this control freak, Diotrephes, who wants first place. Whenever a church has a dictator, there are bound to be problems in that church. 100% guarantee. And listen, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is grieved when brothers and sisters in Christ cannot exercise and use their gifts to glorify God because one dictator wants their way. Okay? That is dangerous. Has no place in any church at any time. Men and women should be able to serve the Lord faithfully and to be fruitful in ministry and not to be held down by a dictator who wants their way. And that's who Diotrephes was. There's nothing good said about this man. And need I say this, his name is forever recorded in Scripture. I mean, do you want your name recorded in Scripture for everybody to read? What if... Something that you said in your life or that you've done was recorded for people to just open and read at any given moment in time. Oh, Justin, you did what? You said this. Eric, you voted that way at the last business meeting? So on and so forth. Diotrephes got called out here. And it's sad to think that there are many churches that are under a dictatorship Amen. of a diatrophies problem. It can be a lay leader. It can be a pastor. It can be any person in the church. As long as they have a voice loud enough, Brother Bob, and the personality to go with it, right? But let's look at him. So diatrophies, what do you do? He rejected the truth and he loved himself. That's essentially what he did. He rejected the apostles. He rejected John. He rejected the truth because he loved himself. And so one of the defining characteristics of every sinful human heart is pride. It starts there. And so Diotrephes had a pride problem. And his pride problem led him to love himself. His pride problem wanted him to have first place among the brethren. He was selfish, self-centered, and self-seeking. It was all about diatrophies. Look at what I'm doing. That's not going to be allowed in my church. Not in my church. I'm not going to read this letter. I'm going to protect you from this. Very likely, John was writing to him to say, Welcome, fellow believers. Nope, not going to do it, he said. Really, with what we see with diatrophies, there was nothing said about doctrine or heresy that he was maybe teaching something false. It was about behavior, his conduct within the church. Why did he reject John? Well, probably because John stood in his way. Challenged him on wanting to be a dictator. Maybe that's why. I don't know. He loved to have first place among them. He was arrogant. He desired power and self-glory. Well, what else about diatrophies do we see? Well, he was a divisive troublemaker. Causing up division in the church. He was a troublemaker. And John was not going to overlook this. What does John say? He points it out that he says, This is why if I come, I will remind him of the work. So John is like, I'm planning on coming to this church. And I will address this in person with diatrophies. Wow. Not only is your name written down, but you've got an apostle of the Lord Jesus that's going to walk through your doors and address this issue should tell us this is important. 
this is important to avoid. This is a community in crisis. This church is in crisis mode because they've allowed a dictator to take over. He was talking wicked nonsense. He was gossiping and slandering John and those who were teaching the truth, maliciously slandering them. You will never find, by the way, in the Bible that any time that gossip and slander is mentioned, that it's mentioned in a positive way. Gossip and slander will not bring any growth or any positivity to the body of Christ, the opposite. And so he was, he had loose lips, we'll say it that way. And he was maliciously slandering John. No place for that, friends, at all in any of our churches. No place for gossip and slander. Because then we have a pride issue if we start to toy with gossip. And did you hear about this? Or why are we doing this? And I think Justin's lost his mind. You know, all these things, you start, you start trying to find a crack to where you can entertain a conversation. And then that conversation happens. And you get somebody who matches your energy. And then that person brings somebody else in on it. And then before you know it, you have a group of people who have been loose-lipped over here in any church causing problems. Church is trying to move forward. The churches should be moving forward, everyone, to serving the Lord faithfully, following His direction faithfully. But that you've got so many speed bumps that are in the way because of, of, of chit-chat going on. Right? And that is a universal issue in churches. It's not just specific to one. I'm not talking about here necessarily. <laughs> it's an issue. Anywhere you've got people, you have problems. But you have opportunities to solve those problems in a way that honors God and Christ, in a way that is calling fellow brothers and sisters to come together for the cause of Christ, not our own agendas, okay? It is about Christ's way. It's in our name, right? And so... John goes to verse 11 after he's pointing out that, that Diotrephes was inhospitable and um, hostile. He goes on to say, don't imitate this man. <laughs> don't imitate evil. Imitate that which is good. Continue doing what you're doing because it would make sense maybe that Gaius was expelled, that John is writing to encourage him. Hey, you're doing right. Continue doing what you're doing. Live faithfully for the Lord and allow fellow believers to come in and treat them with hospitality. Continue to find that encouragement. So very likely, guys, might have been expelled, facing challenges with this dictator. The diatrophies was hostile. The opposite of Gaius, complete opposite. If you so even entertained the belief that you were going to provide hospitality to a fellow believer or that you agreed with John... There's the door. He was the first to say, you don't have any place in here. You're not going to mess with my church. That's dangerous and destructive. Now, what about Demetrius? That's enough about Diotrephes. That's all we know about him, by the way. He's get, he gets two verses in the Bible, and those verses are enough to tell us what we need to know about him and people like him. Charles Swindoll said, um, he was telling of a story. I'm just going to mention this. I'm going to probably butcher it. He was telling of a story whenever him and his wife moved to California. They were in a, a, a ministry. And he got to stay at a fellow minister's home as they were out of, out of the area for a while. And he had a, they had a Siamese cat named Sinbad that loved to have first place in everything wanted to eat at the table, wanted to sleep in the bed. And so Charles Swindle locked the cat out of the room and the cat clawed and clawed and clawed. And he was trying to break this cat. He actually said he was trying to teach them the hierarchy of the animal kingdom and how in Genesis we're told that we have dominion over the animals. And he said Sinbad would not listen to him and kept clawing and meowing and throwing a fit to the point that the cat actually went down the hallway and started running into the door. And he said he never got to break that cat. And then I love Charles Swindle in the way that he can be so just like that. And then he can just come right in to say there are people like that in our churches that will just claw and push and run against the door 
to have their way. And Charles Swindle suggests, he goes, my suggestion, just like with Sinbad, put them outside and lock the door, he said. <laughs> but anyways, I digress after that one. That was a funny little story I read and had to share that with you. Didn't actually plan to share it with you, but it happened. So my Sunday school class knows all too well about that. So Demetrius, verse 12, as we bring this plane down to its path to land. Verse 12. Everyone speaks well of Demetrius, John says, even the truth itself. And we also speak well of him. And you know that our testimony is true. Just like Diotrephes, we don't know much about Demetrius. He's given verse 12. And what is said about him in so few words in one verse is what we should all strive to be. We should strive to be like a Gaius and we should strive to be like Demetrius. Like I said earlier, it's believed that Demetrius may have been the one to deliver this letter to John. And John is saying, you can welcome him. <laughs> he has a good reputation. And so what do we know about him? Right here. He was reputable among the community of Christians. It says, everyone meaning everyone within the community of believers <coughs> speaks well of Demetrius. Oh, yeah. He has a good reputation. Your reputation is so important. Your integrity is important. You lose your reputation, you lose your credibility. Reputation is key. And Demetrius was reputable among the Christian community. We also read in that verse that he was committed to living the truth because the truth even testified to Demetrius's goodness. He wasn't perfect, not perfect, but he was faithful and he was committed. The exact opposite of Diotrephes. And then we also see here, so he was reputable among Christians. He was committed to living the truth. And then his character was confirmed by Christian leaders, John namely being one of the ones that confirmed Demetrius's character. That this is a man you can trust this is a man who is good. This is a man who is walking faithfully in the truth and has Christ in his gaze, in his goal, has his focus. He is not focused on self and promoting self and creating crisis within the body of Christ. He is about bringing unity and harmony and strength and encouragement to feed the church's goal of exalting Jesus, evangelizing edifying, equipping, and extending love. That was who Demetrius was. That's who Gaius was. And there was one problem, and it was Diotrephes. And he, John says, I have more to say, but I would rather do it in person. That's how he closes his letter. He says, I have many things to write to you, but I don't want to write to you with pen and ink. He says, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to to face. Peace to you. The friends send you greetings. Greet the friends by name is how John closes his letter. He is saying, <laughs> and there is something to be said about communication yeah. here. That John could have written more, couldn't he? We could have had a much longer letter mm. in 3 John, but John decided to keep it short because he wanted to deal with it in person. He wanted to give encouragement in person. He wanted to rebuke in person. He wanted to expose diatrophies to the church, potentially even executing church discipline when it comes to diatrophies. And it's very likely, based off of what John said, that um, not to imitate evil, but that if, if, if a person may not even know God, if they're performing evil works, very likely that diatrophies might not have even been a born-again Christian. And he was in a position of leadership and influence in the church. It's also very possible. John's goal and agenda wasn't come to tear somebody down, but to build the church up, to call to repentance, to rebuke, to help this church in crisis, to point the church to people like Gaius and people like Demetrius. Be like these guys. Imitate them because they're imitating the life of Christ. Amen. They love one another. Right. They love the truth. And it is shown in their walk. It is shown in their talk. Praise 
And those are people you can trust. Those are people with their heads screwed on right that you can trust because their focus is Jesus, nothing else. Exalting Christ and not exalting themselves. And so that's how Third John comes to a close, coming face to face, not through a text message or an email, but a conversation one-on-one to bring the church back in harmony, in unity. And I hope that through this sermon series, you've got to see the passion that John wrote with. How he, there was no time to just waste words. He got right to the point in 1 John calling out the Gnostics, calling us to walk in the light as God is in the light. All throughout it, to love, to walk in the truth. In 2 John, again, the topic of truth Not welcoming in unbelievers, not unbelievers, false teachers, sorry, because of the destruction that that can have. Again, that Gnostic heresy. Don't welcome that in because if you welcome in and show hospitality, you're supporting their ministry. And in 3 John, again, battling for truth and love in the form of hospitality to fellow believers.